More foreign than that. I'm not even Scottish. I'm, not. <laughs> I'm from Ireland, but then again, that's where all the Scots came from. So, that's it. my husband's German. He's voting yes as well. <laughs> so, the wonderful thing about this campaign is we do not have to come in and get a DNA test, as Suzanne showed. All we have to do is we have to want to live here, and we have to want to build the new Scotland, and that's what this is about. You know, we get caught into what would our policies be, what would their policies be, and so on. But the only thing you're voting for on the 18th of September is, do we take control? Do we take those decisions? Do we keep that control? Or do we hand it back the following day and hope that, well, maybe now and again, we'll get something we agree with? I'm a lot older than Aileen. <laughs> and all of my adult voting life, has been dominated by the Tories. And as was mentioned, the wonderful 1997 things are going to get better. I remember that. I remember um, Alan Milburn saying, we're getting rid of all these trusts that Mrs Thatcher has set up, all this let's pretend that the NHS is a business. We had that up here. Some of you would be too young, some of you might not remember. But each hospital was to pretend they were a separate business. And the GP was to pretend to buy services from that hospital. Labour come in and they say, we're getting rid of all that. We're getting rid of all these different letterheads. We're going back to being the NHS. That lasted six months. <laughs> and then they started a project that they called Foundation Hospitals, which was just trusts, but with bells on because if they could get themselves meet certain financial uh, kind of hoops that they would jump through, they could do whatever the hell they jolly well liked. So Labour started that off. And what you don't know is because up here that has reversed since devolution, since 1999 we have gone back to a traditional public-based cooperative NHS, is you don't know how far down the road they are south of the border. We're getting no media coverage whatsoever up here. And so people think, well, I'll vote no because everything's okay. I'm sorry, in five years, England will not have an NHS, as you understand it. Mm -hmm. And if we vote no, in 10 years, neither will we. Because they control the pocket money. They decide what we get to spend. Now, how things have happened down south is the NHS has been completely broken. They have trusts again, and the big guys get to be foundation hospitals. But instead of a health board or the government strategically planning health, they have what are called commissioning groups. And so it's little groups of GPs buy services. And this time, they're actually buying. It's not pretend money. It's not computer money. It's actual money. And the hospitals get paid by results. So if they do X number of breast cancers, they get X amount of money. So we now have that the entire focus of these hospitals is the money in and the money out. And we have managers too. And my apologies if anyone is a manager. Um, they don't always make life easy. We don't always see eye to eye. But obviously we require to make sure we spend that money as well as possible. But what we have down south is we have private companies who are providing health. The biggest provider after the government is Virgin Health. Every single service that that GP group have to buy, they have to put out to tender. So if a private health company comes in, an American company, or a big French company come in, or Virgin Health, biggest provider after the government, there is a presumption towards appointing them. And so all sorts of services have got splintered down. Surgery is being provided by little independent service providers. Now they don't want to do the expensive stuff. You go in there, you get your hip done, and it goes badly wrong. Who picks up the pieces? The NHS. So the NHS is gradually ending up that they have to provide the really expensive stuff, the intensive care, the huge car crash, the, the complicated cancer while the private bits just pick off the things that are easy to do. So, where does that leave the local hospital? It's now much more expensive to run. You can't train young doctors that way because all the operations they trained on are gone. And what you have completely lost is any sense of overview, of planning, of strategy. 
Now, you don't need to turn up to your GP with your credit card yet. But when Mrs. Thatcher talked about introducing actual charges for healthcare, it couldn't be done. The NHS had no mechanism for handling real money at all. Believe me, these companies know how to handle real money. There are already articles. I get sent stuff every day by my college, and it includes changes that are happening south of the border. They have prescription charges. That's basic 101, having to pay for health care. We've got rid of them. And they go, oh, you can't afford that. You know, Joanne Lamont says, oh, we can't afford that. That's money for nothing, you know, something for nothing culture. Only 10% of the population ever paid for their prescription. <laughs> Kids don't pay. If you're retired, you don't pay. If you have certain chronic illnesses, you don't pay. If you're pregnant, you don't pay. So you actually were only collecting this tiny amount but you needed this whole big administration to do it. So it was, it was touch and go whether it was ever really cost effective. And what did they have south of the border? Eight pounds, ten pence. Not for a prescription. The media like to make it say, oh come on, it's only eight pounds. It's eight pounds per item. Now I don't look like a complete croc, but I'm on ten medications a day. That's eight pound, 80 pounds every eight weeks. So what they have, is they've already shown, is one-third of scripts are not being filled. So people are going to the pharmacy and they're going, excuse me, look, what is the most important thing for me to take? So what happens? Their illnesses get out of control. They end up in their local hospital. It doesn't make sense. I was operating with a chap in Glasgow. We were doing a breast reconstruction and he's actually already been appointed in Newcastle. And he's just up in Glasgow for a year to get extra training in plastic surgery. And I was kind of saying, you know, what's it like? And he's like, oh, you know, it's great for us because the managers love us. We're going to attract lots of patients from a huge area. So we're expanding and sucking patients out of other hospitals. Now that sometimes makes those other hospitals not viable. So they become bankrupt. There's a lot of that happening down south. And I said, yeah, but, you know, what happens if, if, if they don't like what you're doing? What happens if they come and say, oh, we don't want you to do this reconstruction because it's more expensive. We want you to use implants because they're cheap. Oh, no, 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 we're fine. But then he comes out with the guys who do the upper GI surgery. So that's gullet cancer. They're in danger of being told they can't do gullet cancer because the fee they get paid doesn't cover how much it costs to do. So his hospital, big, big hospital in Gateshead, are thinking about unilaterally declaring we don't treat gullet cancer anymore. Well, what happens if all the hospitals in an area do that? There's absolutely no sense of strategy or planning or avoiding people falling through the cracks. Now, as was mentioned, now some of these grand things you had me down, I'm not doing all of them anymore. Obviously, your internet was kind of going back. <laughs> but I was on the Scottish Cancer Group in 99. I was on the Scottish Quality Assurance Group. I was part of setting up networks in Scotland. We've got three, West, North, East, East, that try to look at quality, that look at sharing ideas, that look at taking whole groups of hospitals forward so that we provide the best we can. In 2001, I was part of writing standards for breast cancer for Scotland. We visited every single unit in Scotland in 2001 and 2002 and published our report. We have published every year since then the data for every unit against those standards. I've been sent an email by Breast Cancer Campaign to say that the NICE standards, which were only produced in 2011, pardon me, they're not being measured. Because this isn't a big cooperative NHS anymore. Apparently the legal responsibility is each one of those little groups of GPs is legally responsible to make sure that the hospital provides good care. You tell me precisely how they are going to do that. How would they know? What we have is you have people with knowledge and expertise. Everyone's data comes to one meeting. We look at it. We're all named and shamed, the dirty washing is up in front of us, and we talk about, what is your problem in Ayrshire? How could we make that better? Well, over here in Edinburgh, we've tried this, and we thought of trying that. 
That's what you want, is you want this cooperative sharing of quality going forward. So that's something that we've achieved since devolution. That's something we will lose. And people need to think about that before they vote no. For me personally, I've got other reasons. You talked about earlier on people going south. Well, my son is 20, and I would like that there was actually an economy and a future for him in Scotland. I don't want him to have to go. I don't want to be the absent granny that sees her grandkids twice a year. So for me, I would like us to become that engineering marvel that we were with the telephone and the television and the Tarm Academy and everything else that we invented that my husband says Germans invented first. <laughs> not true, not true. You know, the genes haven't died out. Scots are still inventive. In our universities, we're still inventing things. Let's be able to take them forward. And if we can generate this more lively, stronger economy, let's share it. What we have at the moment is we have this wealthier getting wealthier getting wealthier, poorer getting poorer. That is an unhappy and an unhealthy society. So I would like to see that at some point we have, what's the difference between a minimum wage and a living wage? Why do we have two? If you can't live on it, it shouldn't be the legal minimum. That's how we would share things out. We would look at keeping and even further improving our public services. So that whatever wealth we are generating up here, whether it's from oil or whiskey or salmon or our inventiveness, we're all benefiting from, regardless of our background. Mm -hmm. And a very personal thing for me is I wouldn't be standing here as a doctor if we were paying £9,000 a year. Mm -hmm. My stepfather chucked me out of the house when I was 18. Now, I know that the idea is that you don't pay it until you get to the end and until you're earning plenty of money. But you're talking five years to do medicine. That's 45,000 just in tuition fees. Minimal living costs in halls and books and everything else is 6,000 a year. And that's not going to the pub. You're knocking on the door of 80,000 pounds. That's a mortgage. How on earth? would I ever have considered as an 18 year old signing up to that. So I wouldn't be a breast surgeon. I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing. And down south, there will be lots of kids who are not doing what they should be doing. We need to make sure that we keep that here. So we're the generation who have the honor, the opportunity, and the responsibility to vote yes and take our power into our own hands and then roll our sleeves up and spend the next decade building the Scotland we want. Thank you.